Hello, thank you so much for joining us for implementing data-driven storytelling techniques in Power BI. I hope you've taken a chance to explore everything PASS has to offer this week and that you'll submit a session evaluation to let me know how I'm doing. My name is Megan Longoria. I'm a consultant with Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting. I am a data platform MVP and I live in Denver with my dog, Izzy. Our moderator today is Carrie. He is my coworker at DCAC. So if you hear the disembodied voice of Carrie, he's here to help out with questions and discussion. Oh, also we have posted a few links that I'm referencing during this presentation into the discussion so that you have those available to you, but I'll show you what you need to know during the presentation. So I'd like to start out talking about what are the elements of a story? Just any story. What are the key parts that actually make it a story? In general, I think there are about five components. First, there's context. You need to set the stage. You need to explain the environment, the surroundings, uh, any necessary backstory. And then we have characters. In a story, there's usually a main character or a group of main characters. So it's the people the story is really about. And then those characters determine how the plot will develop. And they usually encounter a problem or some kind of conflict. And the plot is really centered around this conflict and how the main characters attempt to resolve the conflict. People love a good conflict. And of course, after we have problems and a resolution, we start getting really invested in how it works out for those characters. So our fifth element is emotion. Uh, Will Storr said, a story is a description of something happening that contains some form of sensation or drama. In other words, an explanation of cause and effect that is soaked in emotion. Uh, it's this emotion that's crucial to the story. They make you feel and that feeling is what causes you to remember the story and potentially act on any lessons that come out of it. Stories tend to have a pretty familiar structure. There are some options in how you can structure a story, but it often takes the form that we see here. There's a recognizable beginning, middle, and end with a narrative arc that goes through it. You might also know this as situation, conflict, and resolution. Um, in the beginning, we introduce our context or setting as well as our characters. And then we introduce the conflict and we build up to a climax before we come to the resolution where the conflict is solved and we all live ha happily ever after, at least in some stories. Another common structure for a story especially in data storytelling, is using the middle of the story to explain what could be and then contrasting that with how things are now. For example, when I was in college, I studied international business with minors in computer science and Spanish and Latin American studies. And I did my study abroad in Chile. And I always kind of wanted to live in Central or South America uh, for at least for a while. But life took other interesting twists and I currently live in Denver, but sometimes I think about what could be. And one of my favorite animals is the capybara. Not sure if you're familiar with those. They're very large rodents related to guinea pigs and chinchillas, but they can be four feet long and two feet tall. They are very social animals. And there's a whole subreddit called Critters on Capybaras, where you can see all kinds of animals hanging out on top of a capybara. I dream of a farm in South America where I raise capybaras. But right now, I live in Denver with a cranky bulldog. I would live in a hut and enjoy being close to nature. But right now, I own a townhome in Denver that requires cleaning and maintenance and a nice big mortgage payment. Capybaras are so chill and social, but life in Denver is full of stress and I barely know my neighbors. 
So as soon as we get through this pandemic, I should sell my house, move to South America and start a capybara farm. Then I could live a life free of super expensive housing, spend more time outdoors and be less stressed. And of course, just be friends with a capybara. So why do we even use storytelling in a data context? The very first thing is that stories have a really logical structure. We present background characters, conflict, and then resolution. You get the information you need, and then you move to the next step in the story. It's easy to follow. Every culture has stories. We're familiar with how they go. Uh, young children can make up stories. Stories are also engaging. We get wrapped up in the story because we love a good conflict and it's satisfying to see the resolution. That emotion I mentioned earlier gets us all caught up in the story. And it also makes it really memorable. Uh, there are probably some stories that you remember from your childhood. I can tell you the story of the three little pigs today, even though I haven't told it or heard it in well over a decade. So I want to have us think about what really is a story in data biz though? Because we use that term a whole lot. Uh, it kind of makes people either think everything is a story or they're really concerned that they're never telling a story. There's a, a whole series of blog posts on policy biz by John Schwabish. And one of the best things he says in there, I think, is this quote. While many of us use the word story over and over again as we make our graphs and visualizations, I think we need to be more careful with the word and use it when appropriate. When we are getting people to feel deeply and when we're leading them to a meaningful climax. I'm gonna share this other quote with you, which I think is really interesting. Um, and before I do that, if you don't aren't familiar, you can go ahead and post questions and discussion items and I'll catch them at the end of this section. And so we'll answer questions throughout. Um, this quote is from Nightingale, which is the Data Visualization Society's uh, blog. And it's from Joshua Smith who won the Tableau, I wanna say the Zen Master Contest uh, a year or two ago. And he, one of the things they rate them on is storytelling and he got rated really highly but here's what he had to say afterwards. He wrote a whole blog post about, is your data actually a story? And what he says is it's important to highlight that a visualization isn't more or less powerful, beautiful, or important because it does or does not tell a story. So if you were feeling like everything needed to be a story and you just weren't quite getting there, I have some good news for you. There's actually a spectrum. Uh, there's a spectrum that starts on the far side with annotation. Annotation is really just well-organized data visualization that has a logical order that's useful to consumers. On the far side is story. Story is the thing with the plot, with the climax, and all of the emotional engagement, the conflict and the characters for people to get attached to. But right in the middle is narration. So this is where we describe what's going on and we frame our reader's journey that maybe there isn't a true conflict or a lot of emotion. If you can get your Power BI report to story, that's great. Uh, sometimes it's just not a story though. So we have this tendency to do this very dry, sparse reporting that's barely an annotation moving your report further right towards story on the spectrum humanizes your topic. It makes it more relatable and more memorable. So a lot of the time, what, our, what we're really aiming for is just narration, just move it further away from simple annotation so that people get that nice flow and that they do get engaged, but maybe it's not a true story. So I do wanna mention that the idea of the spectrum is also in John Schwabish's blog post series. And so I have adopted it and I really like it because I think this frames it 
so much more nicely than just walking around telling everybody to tell stories with their data all the time. It's just very, it's not that it's not true. It's just kind of imprecise wording. And I want you to know that if you didn't feel like you were telling a full story, maybe you weren't and maybe that's okay because not everything is a real story and that's fine. But knowing that not everything is a real story doesn't give you license to just throw a bunch of junk on the page. You still need to have it organized coherently. You need to provide the right amount of context so that your consumers get the meaning they need out of the report. So you need to have, I've seen reports that are, you couldn't even say they were annotation. There wasn't even enough quite information and supplemental context to do that. So maybe your report is not a story, but you still need to think about how do I tell a narrative? How do I provide enough information and guide people through my report in the right way that actually gives them what they need? But after thinking about stories like this, I felt like a lot of my reports were not telling a story. So I threw a poll up on Twitter just today and I gave people a chance to vote on it. And I just asked them, in the last six months, have you actually made a Power BI report that told a story with data? And the results were about what I expected. Almost half of people said no. Half of people, 43, 44% said yes. And then 8.5% said they weren't sure. So maybe that means they have trouble really defining what story means. And that's pretty common. So if you've been feeling like that, you're in good company. So what happens if I don't have a story? Oh, and Carrie, are there any questions to be addressed so far? Negative. And awesome. I forgot to remind you. <laughs> That's okay. So if I don't have a story and I just have a report with annotation or narration, what do I do? And you might have seen some similar concepts in Ted's uh, presentation earlier that's part of this uh, learning pathways. So the very first thing you do is to start with message. You need to be able to, as you are designing your report, thinking about it upfront before you put anything on the page, tell me why you're making the report. What do you expect people to get out of it? You need to be able to tell a consumer in two sentences or less, so what? Why, why would they even bother reading your report? And you want to do this at the whole report level first, but then you need to do it for each page and visual. This is kind of a whiteboarding or a storyboarding exercise. You can literally take sticky notes or do the digital equivalent and don't even think about, you know, is it a slicer? Is, should this be a bar chart or a line chart? Be able to say, I know that I'm going to have this message here. And then rearrange your ideas until you get that good logical order. So I wanna show you an example that I really like because I think it does a good job with the message and the title being very clear. Um, this, I actually found this in the Data Visualization Society Slack channel. And I asked the author if I could use it as an example of something that really has a good message and then everything else on the page clearly supports that message. So we start with, and I'm gonna, zoom in just a little bit, the cost of an Oscar nomination. So we have data about movies and their production budgets and their Oscar nominations. And this person wanted to find out if a larger production budget meant that a movie would get more Oscar nominations. And she clearly states at the top, the answer is no. Those are not uh, highly correlated. Having a big production budget doesn't automatically mean that you get Oscars. Right after that very clear descriptive title that states her conclusion, we have supplementary information that supports the message. So she kind of gives you that initial context. Well, she, she wanted to answer this question. Of the Oscar nominees, Avengers Endgame actually had the highest production budget, but it only received one nomination. 
whereas Joker received 11 nominations and had less than 20% of the budget of Avengers. So she gave you some, some good information to get you interested. And then she has charts that clearly support everything she's doing at the top with her title and her message. The chart on the left is number of Oscar nominations. I'll zoom in a little bit. And the chart on the right is production budget. Those two things are clearly fundamental to answering her question and showing you how she got to her conclusion. So this is what I mean when I say start with message and be able to justify that everything you're putting on the page actually supports that message. And if you can't tell me why you're including a chart or how it supports your initial message for the whole report, then maybe you need to consider removing it or replacing it with something else. So anytime I talk about message, I immediately get the question, well, my data is not static. How do I state a conclusion? How do I, how do I do this when my Power BI report refreshes and my data will be different tomorrow? Well, when your data values change, it actually changes the way you and your report consumer uh, relate to the report. So we can't know today if we've got a sales report that sales are up this quarter because they might not be up uh, you know, next quarter. The numbers are constantly changing. When that happens, we change how we actually approach the design. And whereas with more explanatory data viz where the analysis is done and we're just sharing the conclusions, the report creator there is taking on all the responsibility for storytelling or sharing the message. Exploratory shifts some of that effort over to the report consumer. So we have sort of a vague plot point without the details of the specific numbers. And we provide interactive controls for the user to focus on the slice that they care about, that's most significant to them. If you're doing an expense report, maybe someone who is a department manager filters down to their department and that's what they care about. So we provide signals, which are things like KPIs, uh, just big cards, metrics that, that people need to know how, how things are going for whatever our subject is. Um, we provide context, that's all that background information, supplemental things uh, that your report consumer would need to form their own conclusions. So now instead of us making the story as report creator, the report consumer actually completes the story. So this tends to be what your typical corporate Power BI report is like. You've got that dynamic data. And there's actually a very nice term for that. And it's called story forming. If you're familiar with Andy Kirk, uh, he wrote Visualizing Data. He taught me this term and I blogged about it on my blog. Uh, you can go read that at datasavvy.me. And basically how this works is you just change the way you think about storytelling and change to story forming so that you don't know the answer to your question, but you do know the question that you want to answer. We might not know that, or we might not be able to say bicycle sales are up year over year, because that's not always true. We might just know that we want to show year over year sales by product category. So even with dynamic data though, we can try to edge ourselves more towards story instead of just plain annotation or nothing at all. In Power BI, this might actually mean using DAX formulas to populate titles, uh, to provide text explanations, and you can use conditional formatting to help with that. There's also the new smart narrative visual that can help pick out the key points um, on your page or in your data set or even from a specific visual. You can also use things like the enlightened data story custom visual to make sure that the numbers get plugged in uh, with some static text. So we're, it's as if we're telling a story, but the actual plot details are data-driven. 
We could also add a bit of machine learning for forecasting or clustering, explaining key factors to help people pick out important data trends, even in this dynamic setting. So I wanna show you a really simple story forming example. This is a report I built last year about questions people ask about Power BI on Stack Overflow. We can see I have some interactive controls in the form of slicers. This could be other things. It could be your filter pane, uh, certain buttons connected to bookmarks. And then we have signal. That's those big cards, the waffle charts with the big numbers. How are things going? There's also some signal because of my conditional formatting in this table that's kind of acting as a heat map also. And then we have some line charts that provide context. And that provides additional information for our report consumers. So the way this report goes, uh, we're just organizing it in a very logical order. First, if I tell you, we're looking at Power BI questions on Stack Overflow, and my audience is people who are learning Power BI that are either looking for more information, they need help on a specific thing, or they know Power BI and they wanna go help answer questions about it. So I'm telling you there were 4,361 questions asked. There were 2,800 users asking those questions and there were 4,287 answers. Uh, every question gets about one answer and the median life of the question, meaning how long it stays active is about a day. So people get pretty quick responses. There are also lots of comments which are used to clarify things as people are trying to help the original question asker. Um, Questions can be scored, upvoted, because people think they're useful. That doesn't really happen in Power BI topics as much. They're pretty neutral. And then 77% of questions get answered. So if you were thinking about asking a question that can tell you, you know, maybe there's a good chance it gets answered. If you were thinking about answering questions, only about 38% of questions get Answer, uh, get their answer accepted. So that might, if you're in it for the internet points, that's probably not going to work out very well for you. But very few questions are marked as closed, meaning it was an inappropriate question, it was off topic, or they didn't provide enough information for people to really help them. So we get all of that um, in that order. And that's kind of important. The last part is that big table. Now, if you're looking for help in Stack Overflow, you might, if you're asking a DAX question, you might be in luck because that's very, very popular out of all the topics related to Power BI. But if you were going to ask maybe a data visualization question, there are very few of those. So this might not be the right forum for you. So we can see there that um, sorry, freezing there. We can see there that the the order matters a lot in how we consume information. I'm going to open up a Power BI report, which unfortunately just uh, closed on me. So my apologies on that. And I'm gonna show you some of the conditional formatting you can do for story forming. And what I mean by that is we can actually um, use DAX expressions to to populate our titles. There we go. Now it's opening. And so instead of saying things like sales by year, we can actually write conclusions into our presentations, even if we're still story forming and dealing with dynamic data. 
So I'm going to go ahead and bring this over. And get rid of some of the extra stuff here. And you'll notice in this chart, I have an actual statement. I'm saying active employee count has increased over time. But this data refreshes. This is a hires and, uh, oh, wrong one. Hires and separations report. There we go. That's what's supposed to happen. And so I did this. If you open up the visualizations pane, you can go and look at your title and you can see that there's a FX symbol there. And that's because I've actually used DAX to populate that. So it, when you do this, it's just gonna say based on a field value. And then you have to have a DAX measure already populated, already created so that you can use this. So I've done this on all four of the charts minus the decomp tree. And what I like to do when I do this is I'll usually say something like title. So I know how to find them later. So my active employee count over time, and it, you can write any DAX, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's flexible. So at this point, you're just writing DAX to produce the desired result. I basically said, get the number of active employees at the beginning of the period and get the number of active employees at the end. And if the number is positive, then say that active employees has increased over time. If it's the same, then it's remained the same. So this is how I'm actually populating my titles. And you can do this both for titles and for alt text if you're trying to make your report accessible. The other thing you can do is use conditional formatting to um, change your colors so that you highlight the right part that's important. And then when you're actually interacting with the report, I'm just changing slicer values. You kind of see the turnover title of the report changes. So that's what I mean when I say you can use conditional formatting to help you with story forming. And the way you decide how to arrange things on the page uh, should conform to what's called the visual hierarchy. Basically, the visual properties of all the items on your report affects the way people process information. We don't always, we, we gravitate to certain things more than others. And so those things are things like reading pattern. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some examples of several of these, but things, the way that we read in Western cultures is kind of top left in a Z pattern in image heavy uh, pages to the bottom right. Size, when something is really large, it gets our attention more than something very small on the page. Some of these seem kind of common sense or obvious, but when we start putting things on the page, we often forget about this. So I can tell you a story all in one page and direct you to have that logical flow because of this visual hierarchy. I'm gonna show you reading pattern first. So as I said, we read image heavy pages in a Z pattern. This is a report I made about temperatures, the weather in Denver, because I have lived in several states now and everywhere I go, people are like, don't like the weather? Just wait a minute and it'll change. And we all thought we were unique when we lived there and said that, oh, our place is just crazy weather. Well, no, that happens in a whole lot of places within the United States at least. So I made a report to see how much does temperature really change within a day or how, how widely does it vary within days in a month? And when we look at this report, we want to order the things on the page in this Z pattern, because that's naturally in Western cultures kind of how we read things. We start in that top left 
and then we move to the right. So we get our title and then we see that we have slicers that you can interact with. And then we get the title of the violin plot visual and we read the, uh, the explainer, the, the legend to see how does this visual work. And then we actually go through and look at the different violin plots. And then we move down to the, the line chart and we do the same thing there. So we also read items that are larger. When you look at this page, you might look at violin plots first because they're kind of big and oddly shaped. And so because those are one of the larger things on the page, your eyes get drawn to them. We already looked at the stack overflow report earlier. And I wanna show you a second example using this report of how we notice things that are larger first. So your eyes probably go and look at the, the uh, cards first, but they also see there's a big visual that takes up a large portion of the page. And so you get drawn to that for, for multiple reasons, but one, because of size. You also probably notice those cards though, because they've got a border and a background on them so that it, they take up quite a bit of space. Another thing that catches our attention that's part of visual hierarchy is that bright color standout. So when we look at this report, you probably notice that average temperatures text because it's in purple uh, compared to the medium to dark gray text around it. You also probably notice the slicer. And part of that is because the selected uh, metric is, has a dark, dark background and the others have bright purple text. So that's gonna make those stand out. This is just a human thing. We notice these things without consciously really trying to notice them. Here's an example where bright colors stand out. When you look at this page, you probably notice all the blue. Uh, you'll notice in the, the daily temperature or the average temperatures report, the blue and the orange here, the, the purple, those are the things that catch your attention. Another part of visual hierarchy is negative space you want to give your content a little room to breathe. And the more negative space or white space that you have around it, the more emphasis you're actually giving to that content. So I'm gonna go back one. In this report, I actually kind of have two levels of negative space. I have white backgrounds on my charts, but then there's kind of a gray background that I, I have in the layout image I'm using. So I'm giving lots of emphasis to each individual visual. There we go. So there are other things to be aware of with visual hierarchy, and you're gonna use this whether you have a real story, whether you just have a one page report, this is something that's just innate to data visualization. So you wanna be consistent with your typeface unless you're trying to draw attention to something. Basically, we notice things that are different. We notice a color that stands out, we notice when you switch fonts and we wonder why. If there's no reason behind the switch, uh, then you've kind of confused your, your consumers a little bit because we associate change with a change in meaning. You can also use your typeface, your font, to enforce a hierarchy. Think titles, your title of your page and then your title of your visuals. And if you have a text box, maybe you make the text in that text box smaller because it's explaining how do I use this report or how do I interpret this chart. By using size and color and font, you can create a visual hierarchy that says, okay, this is the top line item. This is the second level item. And that helps people understand how to use that report. The other thing to remember is don't let alignment cause distraction. What I mean by that is if you've ever looked at a report and let's say there's three charts in a row, uh, one of those charts is just slightly, let's say lower than the others and you kind of, you get stuck on it. Um, we don't want misalignment 
to cause distraction. So before you get done, remember that alignment is actually part of visual hierarchy. And if you align things, we tend to kind of just look across them or down them. Uh, when something stands out, we're calling attention to it. And you need to make sure that you did, if you're calling attention to something, you did that with purpose. Another thing to remember is that repetition creates consistency. There's also a term called affordances. Basically in design, if you make things very consistent, either within a report or even across reports, people get used to them and then they don't have to relearn how they work uh, when they see the next thing on the page or a similar thing in another report. Think slicer banks. If you have the same slicers across multiple pages, you want to format those slicers to look the same so that they don't uh, cause people to go, oh, this is new. I need to go relearn what all the options are over on this page. If it's the same, and then you go to the next page and it's the same, then they go, oh yeah, I saw that. I know what's in there. Uh, the, the flip side of that is that you can also cause habituation, which is where people get too used to something. So if you actually did need to draw attention to something, you need to change something about it to stand out. If you're always using the exact same theme and you always put slicers here, but you added a new slicer, you may actually want to change something about that slicer, at least for a little while, to call attention to it. Or you may want to use a different color if there's something new that needs emphasis in your report. So if things are consistent, people learn how to use them and don't have to relearn. If they're too consistent, people stop even noticing them on the page. So that's just any report and kind of working your way towards narrative. But what do you do when you actually know you have a narrative or a story? How do we actually implement that? Great, so we're supposed to tell a story with our data. So what, how do we, how do, we do that? Uh, Carrie, any questions so far? No, ma'am. All right, we're going to keep going. So the best thing that I've read on the actual techniques of telling a story with data is this Microsoft research publication called Emerging and Recurring Data-Driven Storytelling Techniques. And what they did was to look at the techniques used by data viz practitioners to tell a data-driven story, and this is regardless of the tool. So a lot of these are from news articles, but not all of them. There's some Tableau reports that got analyzed and a few other things as well. And I really like this paper because it's very practical and very applied. So I'm gonna talk you through the four broad categories that they identify in this paper of how people actually tell stories. And then I'll show you examples that they have in the publication. And then I'll show you an example that I made in Power BI. And you'll notice that some of my reports do use multiple techniques. So they cross some of the four categories, but that happens quite a bit. Um, not all of them use all four all the time, but a lot of them use more than one. So I think you should have this link in the discussion. And this is the actual paper. What's cool inside of this paper, besides a few screenshots of examples, is this chart. And they took the four broad categories and color coded them here. And they took all the samples that they reviewed and they showed within the category, how did people actually accomplish this technique? And out of, for each uh, publication, which techniques did they use? So I highly encourage you to check this out. This was actually published, um, I believe in 2016, but it holds up really well. And a lot of the examples at the very end in their references still work. So you can click on these and see exactly what they were looking at when they wrote this paper. So out of the uh, four techniques, the first one I want to talk to you about is communicating narrative and explaining data. All this really is, is text or video or audio interspersed with data visualizations. So we're gonna look at this example. 
And this is from 538. And it's about a better way to find the best flights and avoid the worst airports. And so it's a it's an article. We see a lot of text. And then we have this chart that's just embedded right in the, the section. And then more text and then another chart. And more text and another chart. And that's really what they mean by that technique. So uh, you'll recognize this, as I said, from lots of news and magazine articles. And we can do this in Power BI. So I have a report about my dog, Izzy. I adopted Izzy uh, this year during the pandemic. And so I didn't know exactly what kind of dog she was. She was listed at the shelter as a bulldog, which is what I had before, but she doesn't look like your normal English bulldog. She definitely has a bulldog face, but I was really curious, you know, what, what's going on here? She has some long legs. So I thought maybe she's a bulldog boxer mix. So I sent Izzy's DNA to one of the doggy DNA places and her results actually came back as old English bulldog. Old English Bulldogs are a mix of half English Bulldog, and then they typically mix them with American Bulldog, uh, American Pit Bull Terriers, and Bull Mastiffs. So the reason they started doing this back in the 70s is because Bulldogs, English Bulldogs, have a lot of health problems. And the original Bulldog uh, was a more athletic breed that could breathe a little easier, wasn't so bow-legged when they walk around. And people are trying to breed them back into that slightly healthier dog. So now I've kind of explained the report. You can see I have text interspersed with, uh, with visuals. In this case, my visuals are actually just pictures of dogs but that's data driven in this case. You can see when I hover over the, the one actual chart, we get some more information from the visuals. You can do this in Power BI in one page or across many pages. Technique number two is called linking separated story elements. And you basically just relate things within your visualization through either interactivity, color, or animation. So this is actually something that's very easy to do if you use report themes in Power BI. You set your colors and then you use them very consistently. And most of the time, this is going to also involve some buttons and shapes and things. So I wanna show you first this report. Um, from the Guardian. And it's about gay rights in the US and it was originally published in 2015. And so it goes through different rights that people have for marriage, hospital visits, adoption, employment, housing, hate crimes and schools. And it divides the US into regions. So Northeast is over here on the right, Southeast, Southwest, Northwest, and then Midwest is along the top. I live in Colorado. So I'm gonna look at this Colorado section and we can see that red is related to marriage, yellow is hospital visitation, blue is adoption. So Colorado allows adoption by a single person and joint adoption by same sex couples. If I want to focus on just adoption, I can scroll down here and that same blue color is used. And they again, break it up by region and then use the color to indicate whether it's joint adoption or single adoption. But this is all related through color. We can see employment is green here. And when we go back up to the top, employment is green up here as well. So that's really how you link things through color. I did the same thing and I'm gonna make this bigger here, in a Power BI report about my company. So this was a report I made last year and it's about 
um, Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting. We're a small consulting company. And one of the things I really like about working here is one, my very smart and uh, involved coworkers who do a lot in the uh, Microsoft data community. And also that we're free to have a personality. We get treated like people at work. So this is our way of saying hello to the community and um, being able to share a little bit of ourselves through a data-driven report. What I did was I uh, sent a survey out to my coworkers, told them I was gonna make a report and asked them if they were cool with me sharing information. And so I've color-coded each of the categories of information that I gathered. The first thing we learn is kind of where we're all located. We're a virtual company. And so we're uh, located across the United States. There's actually uh, six consultants and one salesperson. So we just did a bar per person to represent how long people have been around. And then we can go on and say, oh, we've accomplished a lot, the six of us. Um, we have, and this is actually, <laughs> I should update this since we've all been renewed again. We have a lot of MVP awards across us as well as some VMV experts awards. We also have a lot of experience in education. So if I click into that, I get this whole page about our experience in education. So we can see our number of years working with SQL Server, uh, number of years working with Azure, everybody but one claims to work with Power BI. You can also see a little bit about our educational backgrounds. But notice that same blue color carried over from the main page, as well as being able to click in. So we've kind of got it linked through both interactivity and color. And this one, this was just fun facts, things to humanize us uh, as not just your consultants, but as, as people. So there were seven children across all of us, 11 pets. Some of us are morning people, some people were night owls. I just like to sleep. <laughs> we're fairly evenly split on phones. And of course I had to ask how much coffee we consume per day. I'm actually the one cup a day person. Some of us need five to get through the day. And before the pandemic, we liked to travel so these are the number of countries that each person has visited. And then you can see our hobbies and animal preferences. I have a dog, as you learned earlier, my boss, Denny, has bunnies. And then I can go back. So that was both color and interactivity. The third technique is enhancing structure and navigation, which is really just a fancy way of saying, you can put some next and previous buttons on things or scroll through a report or use breadcrumbs or menu selections. This is often in Power BI what we mean when we say uh, we want an app-like experience because we want those menu selections. So first I'll show you the example they used from the publication and it's about Americans' love for trucks. And this is a scrolly telling report, meaning as you scroll down, the uh, text changes along with the visualization. So as I scroll down, I learn things like car companies are pushing crossovers like crazy. And then I can see the data related to that. Here's the thing about hybrids. And we see the bubbles move. So my version of a similar technique, oh, there we go, is about Denver traffic accidents. So I made the more app-like experience report and I'll make this full screen here. And so I looked at Denver traffic accident data because I wanted to know, you know, traffic in Denver, especially because I grew up where traffic was not that bad, is kind of awful here. And there are a ton of accidents. My car has been rear-ended twice in the four years that I've lived here. 
So is it just that, you know what, all the accidents happen when it's really bad weather, we get a decent amount of snow here. So is it that? Is it just always rush hour? So I took a look at um, different aspects, different characteristics of all the accidents that occurred. And then I gave a nice summary. Since I have static data, I can tell a little bit more of a narrative. And I can tell you, you know what? Accidents actually happen in the afternoon, maybe around lunchtime. Uh, and that's actually more prevalent than the morning rush, which was surprising to me. I would assume people were in a hurry trying to get to work. They're actually in a hurry trying to get out of work. Uh, they happen more in spring and autumn than in winter. And then I can click my button and look at location information. So I have a map and I can go to any neighborhood and see what's happening. Well, it turns out that, um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit there. That's the whole shape of Denver. On the top right is the airport. Downtown is kind of over on the left. And I'll choose Park Hill. Uh, the highest number of accidents occurs on the highways. So we have I-70 that goes along the top there. And then in North Park Hill, we have Colorado Boulevard. So we end up with just a whole lot of accidents of people trying to get to or sitting on the highway. And then I can go to driving conditions. If you thought people mostly had accidents in the dark, in the snow, it's not true. It actually turns out that most of the accidents took place when it was dry on level roads and in daylight conditions. So it's not explained just by weather or slick roads. What's probably explaining most of it is actually the driver action. 24% of accidents were related to careless driving. So I get all of this based on these menu selections. And you could get more in depth. You could actually just do like a bunch of bookmarks and cycle through them one by one. It doesn't have to be a menu selection like this, but both of them are examples of enhancing your structure and navigation in Power BI. You probably don't want to do a scrolly telling report like we saw earlier, just because on the Power BI page, it's gonna take a while for everything to load, but I have seen people do it. You're just gonna really wanna test performance if you try to go that route. Hey, Megan. Yes. We had a question about, uh, I think it's this report here, or no, it was the previous one with the cars, asking if that was a public web page or something that you developed with, with Power BI. The cars? Yeah. Well, the cars is a um, news article. Let me go back. The cars is a news article from Bloomberg. The Power BI reports that I've shown have been the dog, the about our company, and the Denver traffic accidents. Everything else is what was referenced in our publication here in this research paper. Hopefully that helps. Anything else? Yeah, there was one that I asked to follow up on and I lost it. So I'm gonna ask this from, from memory. There was a question about the glossary part in one of the reports. Ah. And it was a question of how that was done. the glossary link. Yeah, so the glossary link was just a button. I'm sorry, I'm trying to avoid the Zoom thing getting in the way here. Um, glossary link. Oh, it would have been on the Stack Overflow one has a glossary link. So that actually is just a button that takes people to a page that explains all the data. So it's a, a button with a page navigation action on it in Power BI, similar to clicking that source button. Oh, it's not gonna load very 
very well. Click, it's just any button in Power BI, kind of the same thing as this. You can have buttons that take you anywhere. So in this one, I can click read our blog and it'll actually just take you to the DCAC blog. And that's just an action um, based on the button. And that reminds me that um, Reed Hansen has the third part of this learning pathway series, and he gets into exactly how to build things with bookmarks and buttons. So if you want to know how to do that, um, if I have a little bit of time at the end, I'll show you, but I know that his presentation goes actually more in depth into exactly how to build this type of thing. Is that it? Yep, yeah, so far. All right. Here is our last storytelling technique. <clears throat> and it's really just providing controlled exploration. So this should be very familiar to lots of Power BI report developers. It's just having dynamic queries that allow users to make a selection. So instead of, let's say, just having a data model and a blank page and saying, go at it, Maybe you have some constrained selections. You can only choose from these few things. This might be a slicer or some buttons that take you to very specific views instead of just anything the consumer wants. So I'm gonna show you. This report, which is also from The Guardian and coincidentally, it's also about Oscars. And this is from um, 2015. And they're trying to answer the question, does winning best director kill your career? So they kind of do the, the normal data viz, a little bit of supplementary information there. And then they go through ratings of different movies, but at the bottom, they have this explore your data thing. Excuse me. And this is where you can type in a director and you can start actually looking through. So I'm going to do Spielberg. So I can go and find what director I want to see information for. And I can choose whether or not I want to show the IMDb rating. They also actually had some exploration in this Trucks uh, Bloomberg article. Because when you get to the very bottom, you can explore here. So I can look at this data, make it a little smaller so it all fits, by major brand, by truck versus car. I can change the color by the same types of things. Where do, where do the automobiles come from? So that's what we mean by controlled exploration. It's not like you gave them a data set and they can do anything they want. You can choose from these four selections for group by or these four for color by or search for a specific item. So my controlled exploration in Power BI is actually about database management. This is a example report I made where I'm giving them some high level information um, that we pull from Azure Diagnostics, so log analytics in Azure, and query store within a database. And we merge all that together. And we can see things like how busy the database is, how many things people are doing, what the most popular queries are. But then I give them a button that, um, will take you to a specific page. And for some reason, I think my mouse is dying. There we go. And it lets them explore database metrics. And here they can choose which metric they'd like to see. So right now, maybe I want to see server A. And here's the percent of storage that's being used. Maybe I'd rather look at CPU percent. And that one happens to be 
asleep. But basically they can go, there we go, and check this out and say, oh, now I wanna learn about, I've got three constrained sets of options. Well, really four with the date. So on this particular server D, I, I can see that my max CPU never really gets above 30, 35%. So this is what's meant by constrained exploration. You could have done this in lots of ways in Power BI. Um, you could, this is an extreme kind of, you can flip out the metric even, but this could have easily been, oh, just a certain bookmark, just a uh, switch which server. You control how constrained it's going to be for your users. A lot of Power BI reports kind of fall into this when we're doing that story forming thing. So that was the four categories of applied storytelling, but really narrative telling, because we can use this even when we don't have a true story. So I just want to walk you through what we talked about. And that's that stories are engaging and memorable, and they can be a great way to get engagement in your data visualization in your Power BI reports. But not everything is a story. And so if you were feeling bad that you couldn't turn everything into the story, you know, your sales report sometimes doesn't have a main character and that's okay. Your reports can be a narrative. And that means that we're trying to present information to our end users, to our report consumers in a way that relates to them. This is essentially humanizing the data instead of just really bland titles and um, very little explanatory text. We add more annotation. We make sure our, our flow is really good for how people think about this information. And then we can use our four storytelling techniques. So there's communicating narrative and explaining data. And that's where we intersperse visuals in between either text or video or audio. And that was the dog report I showed you. We can link separate story elements through interactivity or color or other attributes. And that was the about my company report that I showed you. And then we can enhance structure and navigation. That was the Denver traffic report that I showed you. So you can use buttons to, to go forward and backward or actually have more of a menu like I did in my report. Or you can provide controlled exploration. That may be having slicers to let people choose selections, whether that's switching out a metric or just slicing by a particular category, giving people the option to kind of drill into or filter out data gives that controlled exploration experience. And that is the end of my content. So I think we have about 13 minutes left to talk, um, discuss anything, any further questions that people have asked. I'm just checking out the uh, comments here. Thank you for the compliments. Okay. Are we back on? Okay. Uh, we had a couple questions come in. Andrew asks, is there anywhere you'd recommend for getting practice on improving my ability to tell a story with data and get feedback critique? I think there are a couple good places. Um, if you're familiar with storytelling with data, Cole Naflick actually runs a monthly challenge. And so there will be a theme and then you can build something in Power BI to match that theme. Um, 
often you can get a little critique. They get the, they pick some of their favorites to post, but people post on Twitter and other people respond. Um, that's a good place to start. In Denver, we actually have a group that's like the Denver data storytelling group. And so um, I've been to a couple of people visited, Alberto Cairo came in and gave a talk. So there are actually, if you look on Meetup, sometimes there's groups about this. There are also some groups that teach you how to tell a story kind of without data. And when you get really good at understanding how to give like presentations, then you kind of flip it to use data and use those same concepts. I'm looking through here. Paul asks, what are your thoughts about using custom visuals and these advanced options realistically in client solutions? Yeah, so custom visuals are a little tricky. A lot of them are so good for really telling a story and getting all those visual attributes right for your visual hierarchy. I tend to only use certified custom visuals and this is probably not possible for everyone, but I tend to use the visuals from companies or people that I know pretty well because there's no guaranteed support. They can change. Um, they could suddenly stop working, to be honest. It doesn't happen very often, but a few of them do. So you have to be careful with them. If it's just like a fun report, use custom visuals all you want. If it's an enterprise report, I think you need to have that conversation. Um, and you need to have the conversation about certified custom visuals as well. So certified custom visuals guarantee that you won't, your, your visual won't access external resources. So somebody's looking at your report in Power BI and it can't go and like send your data off to somewhere else. That's part of the agreement for being certified. If you have really sensitive data, then you probably only wanna to stick to either default visuals or certified visuals because you don't want your data getting out of your tenant. So I think it's it's definitely a balance. And um, you, you just have to talk it over based on the situation, what kind of data you have, what kind of environment you're in. Um, I'm scrolling through, so sorry, I'm a little out of order. When a data viz tool is totally new to a company, what is the best way to ramp up analysts to become good storytellers when they're used to working in Excel? How can leadership help to support that as well? So for me, it's really not about the tool. You can tell good stories in Excel, to be honest. It's just that that's kind of not how people use it by default. I think the best thing you can do is to get people in this habit of doing the message thing first. Like every report has to have a, a purpose and a message. And you need to test your reports with somebody in your intended audience to say, does this make sense to you? Here's how I would think about it. So think that Stack Overflow report and how I walked through each visual and how it was kind of in the order you needed to know the information. I would start with that. I think this is kind of an individual skill like data viz. People are gonna do it a little differently. It's open to personal interpretation, but that you can have some standards. I have a standards document that I give to some customers about how we want our data viz to look for accessibility, for visual hierarchy. So you can have that conversation and start like a center of excellence around that. It's not easy, so <laughs> um, yeah. It's a challenge for sure, but I think you can do it. And then you can share when you've had a success. Executives can kind of get in on it by asking, you know, if there's a report and it's not very good, it's not very useful, even if it's pretty, well, what does this tell me? When people need a new report, they should be able to articulate, what am I supposed to get out of it if they're asking you to build something? Megan, did you have the QR code for the... Oh, um, I do not know. At the beginning, oh, okay. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, what else? Any resources to learn about the topic? See the links at the beginning of the discussion. The one that I kind of wanted the answer to myself because I haven't seen this done was, uh, did you use tooltips to show the pictures of the dog breeds 
in the in that little line chart or bar in the bar chart yeah let me find where i put the izzy report maybe i killed it already I think I killed it. Yeah, it's a report tooltip. Actually, I can find it real quick. So all I did was I used a custom visual for that. And if I click on my bar chart and I go to my tooltips, you're gonna to see a report tooltip, report page, breed photos. So I have a hidden page that's a, sized as a report tooltip. And then this uses a custom visual where I can put um, an image in there. And the image is actually a URL in the actual data. So an image URL uh, populates this and then it's got the breed related to it and that's how it gets filtered to um, show up whenever I hover over the right breed. Yeah, sorry, I don't know anything about the QR code so I'll figure that out later and tweet it. I'm at Emory, but I'll tag SQL Pass in it. Cause... I'm also looking into this now for the QR code. <laughs> I don't, yeah, sorry. Um, we talked about the glossary button. Tool tip for the dog. Someone said, I'm assuming applying all four of the techniques on the same report would be rather overly busy and the techniques should be used sparingly. And I'm gonna say not entirely. In fact, if we go back to their chart of what techniques were used, oh, I went too far. Sorry for the scrolling, this thing. You can see when a line has all four colors, they used all four techniques. So quite a few actually did all four, but some did only three, some did only two. I think there's one or two in here that just did two. Some of them use something else entirely. So it really depends on how you implement it. If everything is about some different visual attribute, I absolutely agree. It could get really busy, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Like you could do the interspersed text and visual alongside linking things through color pretty easily and have menu options. And that probably wouldn't be too busy. And then maybe there's a page in there with controlled exploration. So I don't think you should feel compelled at all to do all four of them. And you really may only need one, but I think it's possible to do all four in a tasteful and useful way. How do you decide if you wanna show the data in a vertical or horizontal bar chart? This will be my, I'll answer this question. Um, Sometimes it's just the data you're showing. Sometimes your labels won't fit. I don't have labels on this one, so it's, <laughs> I have to go to the detail page here. Oh, I don't have labels on that one either. Like if you have really long labels, you probably wanna make it horizontal. When we do things over time, we tend to make them vertical bars, but that's not always true. So, um, it's highly dependent upon the message you're trying to show with your data and how much room you have on the page. So like in the Izzy report, I didn't have room to do a full clustered bar chart, but this one made it a nice stacked bar chart. I didn't want it to be vertical. I liked the way that this explained it. So it's pretty situational. Uh, looking for a last question.
I thought I saw one in here that I missed. All right, I found it. Do you have any tips on how to find time to do high quality data storytelling when you're getting overloaded with requests to produce output? Um, if you kind of think about this and at this technique level, if you abstract it away from trying to do the one report and you basically build up your, your toolbox of how to do this, it becomes a lot easier. So every time I build a report, maybe I've got a library of, um, themes of colors and, and things. And I kind of know how I do menu items. And so maybe I have some background layouts. There's a lot of, of interesting ideas on powerbi.tips as well that can help you. Basically don't do every report from scratch, have themes, have layouts, have techniques kind of built into those. Like I know that I want to drill through by color, like in my um, DCAC report here. This is pretty common for me to do. So when you start thinking about it like this, then you can abstract away the actual scenario and think, how could I do the same thing to apply to this data? And I think that makes things move along faster. And then don't feel bad if not everything is a story. Sometimes it's just a narrative. But I hope I showed you these techniques are pretty, um, they're not very complex to implement in Power BI and knowing about it and thinking about it like that helps. So we are at time. So I'll go ahead and let us close out. Um, thank you. And we'll get the QR code out another way because I don't know anything about it. I'm sorry, but thanks for attending.